It, it is time to start our session. Uh, my name is uh, Guðmundur Haldanarsson. I'm professor of history at the University of Iceland, but also the chairman of the board of the Institute of International Affairs uh, at the university. So uh, this session will be divided into uh, two parts. Uh, it will deal with, in many ways, the uh, kind of uh, the subject, the topic of this conference, which is, uh, is Nordic Solidarity for Peace. Uh, as we know, uh, the Nordic countries, the five Nordic countries, uh, have um, cooperated very closely and intensively uh, on peace, uh, peace promotion in the world, based on their common values of demo demo uh, believe in democracy uh, and pe peaceful solutions uh, to the problems. Uh, it is, in many ways, symbolic of uh, the Nordic role in peacemaking that uh, just last month we were celebrating the 30th anniversary of the Oslo Accords. It is unfortunately uh, not a very happy situation at the moment, but at, at least uh, the Oslo Accords demonstrated uh, the power and the possibilities uh, that of the Nordic countries, how they can, uh, what role they can play in the world. We also meet here at a, at a very particular time uh, in our history because uh, probably in a few months all the Nordic countries will be in NATO. We are dealing with uh, the challenges caused by uh, the Ukraine war and, uh, and, uh, uh, and the kind of changes of the situation of the Nordic countries caused by the war. Some of the Nordic countries are very close to the conflict there, and this is something that will uh, influence uh, the way in which the Nordic co countries cooperate. The focus here is kind of, uh, and the kind of aim of this session is to uh, kind of promote the international uh, research on peace, uh, the institutes of peace research in uh, the Nordic countries, and the dialogue with policymakers. So we have kind of two sections. It, it is divided into two parts, this session. First, there will be a, a opening remarks by two ministers, uh, and then there will be a dialogue between representatives from each of the Nordic countries who are uh, kind of engaged in peace, academic peace research. And then we will end with uh, uh, the minister joining the panel to uh, kind of wrapping this, uh, this up. So, time is short. Uh, I will then introduce the two ministers who will come here up first. We will begin by Annabeth uh, Twinnerheim, uh, who is uh, the Minister of, for Nordic Cooperation and International Development in Norway. And after her will be Guimund Ringi Guibrandsson, who was introduced already this morning, so I'm not going to uh, repeat that. So, Anne, please uh, come up here. Thank you, Professor. Uh, dear friends, dear colleagues, I truly appreciate this opportunity to discuss the role of Nordic engagement in peace processes. Uh, we, the Nordics, have a strong tr uh, track record um, in peace and conflict resolution. It's been an important part of our foreign policies over decades. In some areas, we have cooperated closely uh, in some context, we have operated individually. Um, and may I also say that in my experience, Norway and Iceland as non-EU members have in some cases had an advantage as especially independent mediators. The Norwegian government is devoted to strengthening our commitment to peace and reconciliation. Dialogue is the key word. We need, need more dialogue in challenging times. Lasting peace requires political solutions, which requires dialogue. And in the current geopolitical context, after Russia's horrific and illegal war on Ukraine, we see that the global distrust is increasing. False narratives 
of the causes of the war and also of the indirect consequences that the war has on developing countries in terms of food insecurity, uh, rising costs of living, etc. These are undermining global cooperation, increasing the distrust. Uh, and I have discussed this uh, challenge with my Icelandic counterpart on a number of occasions, and we all agree that the Nordics are in a good position to counter that narrative and to combat uh, it together um, through even closer, uh, closer sort of messaging internationally. Um, let me mention uh, one concrete example of Nordic cooperation in the field of peace and security, namely the Global and Nordic Women Mediators Network. Since 2015, the networks have contributed to promote women mediators, enhancing the participation of women in peace processes and draw attention to the need for gender-sensitive peace processes and peace agreements. The Nordics have set example for other regions that, uh, that now have established their own regional women's network. And the network members engage globally in building capacity, advocating for inclusion of women and drawing attention to the talent pool these networks represent. Just to give you one example. The Nordics have a reputation as honest brokers and defenders of international law. The way we have organized our Nordic societies um, through our welfare states, our focus on, on equality, on redistribution, is also an important ingredient in our soft power repertoire, uh, so to speak. And the key word is trust. Again, trust. We trust each other, we trust our institutions, and we trust that social contracts underpinning our societies will be honored. Increasingly, however, we experience that the cohesion of our own societies are challenged, both from within and from the outside. Internal discord could inevitably impact our reputation and ability to wield our soft power potential. So we need to work hard to avoid that development. And we are facing a complex international environment in which climate change and migration, to name two, <clears throat> add to more traditional local and regional conflicts. And that requires, my friends, innovative approaches and novel solutions where research, academia and policy must work together. And there are no easy answers. The SDG Summit in New York in September made it clear that we must step up our common efforts at reaching the Sustainable Development Goals. And Amina Mohammed uh, made a clear case on that, how the SDGs are a fundament of conflict resolution and uh, peace. Uh, our peace research community has a key role to play in this regard. We need more knowledge, we need new knowledge to better understand the connection between climate change, natural disasters, environmental degradation, poverty, war and conflicts, and to respond in smarter, innovative ways. I truly believe that we, the Nordics, can achieve great things, promoting global trust and dialogue when we move together. In my work as Minister of International Development, time and time again, I see that the values uh, that we share in the Nordic countries give us sometimes a different and very fruitful approach uh, in many contexts around the world. And this is an asset, but it is an underutilized asset. Again, Trust is the key. Decreasing trust between countries, within countries, and in multilateral cooperation is a threat to the very fabric that our region has built our success on. So let us put the Nordic cooperation and integration, our Nordic values that we cherish so much, to even better use internationally, because the need is definitely greater than ever. Thank you.
Dear friends, I think I must begin by thanking Anna Beate, my colleague from Norway, first of all for coming to Iceland and participate in this conference. Um, and I think that that also shows friendship and trust, because you mentioned trust as well. Um, we have cooperated very well as ministers for Nordic cooperation, and I am sure we will continue doing so. Thank you so much for coming here. Um, I remember when we started out with this idea, and you know, Icelanders, they, they are a little bit like, they get an idea and they just do it. So you can just imagine that the idea of having peace as one of the um, one of the emphasis in our Nordic cooperation program, uh, chairmanship program this year, it came very, very, very last minute. And that's very typical Icelandic, uh, but it's also very typical Icelandic to make it happen. And I mean, this event here today is the highlight of this emphasis of our um, chairmanship. Uh, when, we, when we started digging a little bit into this, given the short time we had, obviously, because we were so late coming up with this, um, I hadn't really realized that the Nordics haven't been at war internally for over 200 years. And I thought, wow, well, well pretty good, no? Well, then I thought, well, maybe we should never have been at war at all, but that's another thing. But it's a, it's a reminder of how um, a decision and devotion can lead to a result. And 200 years is perhaps a long time in the, con in the context of war and peace. Um, so. I believe that this long-standing peace has been extremely important to each and every of the Nordic countries and undoubtedly contributed to the prosperity and welfare that the Nordic region enjoys today. Um, so we have managed to find a way to rise above old conflicts and rivalry and seek peaceful solutions to disputes that, occurs, that occur between us. And of course they occur. Uh, I mean, COVID is the most recent example where there were some conflicts because people couldn't move between countries freely. Um, and I believe that the Nordic way of seeking peaceful solutions to conflicts is a vital part of the common culture of our region today. Um, but it didn't come out of nothing. We, after the Second World War, there was an urge among the Nordic countries to make a stronger commitment to each other. And we signed the Helsinki, Helsinki Treaty, and we also established the Nordic Council and later uh, the Nordic Council of Ministers. And perhaps, this is a good example of how we can use soft power to secure peace. Because this Nordic cooperation aims at making it easier to move between the countries, to enjoy the same level of service no matter where in the region you are, to be able to study, to be able to work without hindrances and problems. In other words, you are welcomed in any of the other Nordic countries as if you were a citizen of that same country. At least this is our vision. Um, and I believe that this creates unity and solidarity and that it safeguards internal peace within the region. And to quote my friend Anna Beate, it builds on trust. That is the key. Now, I mentioned in my opening remarks that the Nordics have collectively emerged at the international level as messengers of peace and proponents of international agreements on peace and disarmament. disarmament. Um, we have built this reputation in international cooperation. We, 
and, and there have been some outstanding Nordic individuals that have acted as mediators in international conflicts. But I believe it's only fair to specifically mention Finland and Norway. And I was told maybe you should not say that, but I'm going to do it because I'm never politically correct. And it's one of my aims not to try particularly to be so. But I want to particularly mention Norway. And it's not only because Anna Beate came here, because I think it's more because it's true. Um, and this is a culture that we should encourage and foster actively. We should make peace a cornerstone of the Nordic cooperation. Now, I would also like to comment shortly on the role of the Nordic peace research. Um, and I want to take environmental protection as an example, because I believe that if we get more information on the links between environmental protection, in particular climate change and peace, and the interlinkages in between, we get vital information to build future decisions on. We can mention increased flooding, droughts, wildfires, new heat records being uh, set almost every year. And these will and are already put, putting a huge stress on our societies and our economies. In some regions, we are seeing more and more <clears throat> environmental refugees who are forced to leave their homes in search for better and more peaceful life. And that is in some cases because ecosystems don't support their well-being anymore and social unrest and conflict is, is, is increasing as a consequence. So just as peace is important for environmental protection and action, environmental protection is perhaps even more important to secure peace and even to create peace. So I believe that environmental protection is a critical key to peace, but more research on these interlinkages would be welcomed. Now, I just want to say that in wars, there are no winners, there are only losers. And this is not only true for individuals, but also societies, and it is also true for the environment. At the end of the day, war doesn't solve any problems, it creates problems. Um, but I want to end really with the words of Amina Mohammed on hope. So my question to all of us is really, how can we better foster hope? Remind ourselves of hope when we get um, all these negative news, both about uh, wars breaking out, about the state of our planet, etc., etc. How can we remain hopeful? because hope is a fundamental force for change. So let's remind ourselves of the importance of having a hope, and when we lose the hope, we must find it again. And we must do that, or we can do that, uh, simply by talking to other people and creating a dialogue. So I'm really looking forward to the session and all the conference, of course. And as someone wise once told me, Mimme, you always talk for too long. So now I'm off the stage. I thank the two ministers for the opening remarks. Uh, we have here some uh, keywords, trust and hope. But also more knowledge, new knowledge, which is something we are going to discuss now in the second half of the, uh, this uh, session. I would like to uh, invite the uh, panelists to come up here. And they are Anine Hageman, she is a special advisor for foreign ministry in Denmark. Jani Lilja, uh, director of studies, uh, peace and development at Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. CIPRI. Louise Olson, she is a research director on the Department of Global Politics, Norms and Societies in the Peace Research Institute of Oslo, PRIO. Marco Letti, he is a research director of Tampere Peace Research Institute, TAPRI. 
and Pia Hansson, who is the director of the Havdi Reykjavik Peace uh, Center. So, they are all here. Um. There's so many chairs. It's going to get all the attention to the app. Okay. Well, uh, so we have now already heard some uh, wise words about peace. Uh, now we are going to discuss a little bit uh, the ways in which uh, research, academic research, can contribute to peace uh, and the role the Nordic countries play in promoting peace in the world, and also, you know, how they kind of interact with policymakers. So my first question to you all, and I would like you all to respond to this question, uh, is first of all, what is the role? that peace research has played and could play in the Nordic countries. And kind of tie to that the question, what are the examples of research questions that need to be posed for us to kind of challenge, uh, to meet the challenges of, of promoting peace in the future? So. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think that is a, um, a critical question, and I think in a serious uh, format like this, I would still like to start with a quote from uh, Terry Pratchett. I don't know if you know him, but he writes these fantasy novels. But he has this quote that I think captures sort of the, the essence of, of how I see peace research. And this is when one of his main characters finds himself in a very serious and, and sort of unexpected uh, situation. And this character is called Wimes. He says, the important thing is not to shout at this point, Wimes told himself. Do not, what do they call it, go postal or go uncontrollably angry. Find out, treat this as a learning exercise. Find out why the world is not as you thought it was. Assemble the facts, digest the information, consider the implications. And then you go uncontrollably mad, but you do it with precision. And I think tying back to, to the minister's entry points and, and starting points here, I think Nordic peace research has, has really been a very strong success story. So for example, in terms of, of climate research, if I only look at, at uh, Norway, we have both PRIO and NUPI sort of contributing to both national and international debates. Uh, and I think we also need to recognize that we were actually sort of part of both of being part of founding peace research and being at these research frontiers and also then being engaged in the actual uh, moving forward. Uh, and I would like to, to bring up three points as to why I think that uh, that is, because of course there are many factors that play into this. Uh, but I think those are important to safeguard uh, and also build on because we have invested a lot in this in terms of uh, societal capital to, to, to safeguard this. Uh, the first is that sort of one of the main criteria for success is that we have been very successful in contributing to collecting high quality long-term data. Uh, and we have done that on many dimensions that are critical to our societies. And I think that sounds really, really dry, but in an area where at a time where disinformation is sort of really targeting how we perceive things, having these kind of, of databases that have been built up over decades that we can actually rely on that's gone through high quality testing is really critical. And I think Hans Rusling is a very good example how that actually helps us uh, move forward. But the second point is, of course, that if we tie back to, I think, Mark Twain saying that there are lies, there are damn lies, and then there are statistics. So the other criteria for why peace research in the Nordic countries have been so successful is that it has also done a very high quality sort of analysis of this data that has really tried to avoid all these sort of easy answers. Uh, and I think that one of the things I often uh, tell my students is that if you only find in your analysis the reasons or, or the, the outcomes that you want to find, then your mind is probably playing tricks on you for the social phenomena we are talking about here are so complex. And I think as a decision maker, if you have researchers that only give you the snippets of what you want to hear, then it's time to start asking really critical questions because that, they're probably not giving you a very good foundation for, for decisions. Uh, and in terms of the uh, 
third point then is that peace research also builds on a very long-term engagement by researchers to contribute to social change. It was formed during the coldest part of the, the Cold War and it was built on trying to rectify or trying to, to prevent, to get at the root causes for why we saw the world wars, genocide, colonialism, human rights abuses. So it really sort of is really engaged in, in trying to, to uh, get at those problems. Uh, but doing that in a very then nuanced and sort of strategic way in order to build, be as sort of uncontrollably angry with precision that, that really gets at the, at the root causes. And I think going forward, I would just like to, to mention a few. I know that I was actually chosen to go first because my panelists are, are then going to move us into to the future even more. But there is one area that I would really like to mention and it has been really highlighted both in the Nobel Prize and also here uh, today. And that records sort of women's rights and, and women's involvement in, in peace and conflict. Mm -hmm. Because there we have had very huge progress. The Nordic countries have invested a lot in this. And one area where I see we could all sort of continue to invest together is gender disaggregated data. So how do we actually test, hold ourselves, sort of get at the root causes and do assessments in order to actually be able to be even more effective in, in sort of pushing back uh, this uh, pushback against uh, women's rights. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I'm delighted to be here and I'm very thankful to our incredible Icelandic hosts. Um, as Louise said, I believe that the Nordic countries have truly pioneered peace research as a subject of empirical study. Why is this important? Because when it all started during the Cold War, there were major information asymmetries and uh, knowledge related to conflict and war was not public. It was basically concentrated into the hands of the superpowers and great powers at the time. So that was one key uh, reason for the uh, research institute where I work why it was founded, the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. And it tackled precisely um, the major threat at the time, weapons of mass destruction, tracking stockpiles and investments in that. So it was really to level the information playing field so that everyone, also small states, medium-sized states and interested citizens of the world would know what was going on. Peace research then historically revolved a lot around violence and, and, and conflict. And uh, also the Uppsala um, uh, conflict database uh, actually helped formulate a technical definition of what constitutes a conflict, um, a non-legal one based on the number of, of, of conflict deaths. Um, so we have been providing a global knowledge uh, public good, helping to sort of clear subjective opinions, propaganda, uh, which is all the time present when it comes to matters to do with power uh, and, and violence. Moving forward, I would like to see a deeper and more targeted focus on peace. We see that peace is not just the flip side of war. It's not the absence of war and we have been painfully aware that we can never take peace for granted. So it needs to be subject to rigorous empirical study because peace comes in different forms. It can be repressive, stifling, totalitarian, cold. Uh, and in the Nordic region and across the whole world, I believe that people expect more from a state of peace. We expect a state of individual and societal well-being where everyone is allowed to develop their full uh, human potential. So I think we need to refocus our energy again and pin down what are these enabling conditions um, also in our own societies. We are often a little bit implicit in the Nordic region, but we need to be explicit about the key ingredients um, of peace. And, the ministers uh, uh, pointed to the relevance of trust, present levels of trust, and wh what do we want to aim at? Trust in government, trust in other people in our societies. Um, what kind of cooperative behaviors do we want to see, you know, as opposed to segmentation, fragmentation, large chunks of our societies being excluded? What should social cohesion look like? You know, and, and what are the institutions that we want to see at every level of society that can sort of peacefully resolve and deal with 
with conflicts down to the sort of neighborhood area. Um, and to this, I would add resilience to hybrid attacks against our societies. And the, this also uh, came forward prominently in terms of the disinformation uh, flows affecting um, the whole world. And finally, resilience to cope with climate environmental threats. So I think we need to be far more explicit about the intangible assets of our societies that we need to protect and uh, invest in and that we can collectively as, as researchers monitor um, um, to provide information to, to decision makers. So it's incredibly important, I think, and it's of course um, pertinent that um, we as researchers can help decision makers you know, navigate the compound complex um, problems of today by posing relevant research uh, 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 questions. And I want to pick up on the very uh, pertinent point that was made, the, the question posed from the audience about um, um, instruments for promoting peace. And I want to pick up on the role of development aid. Because I, I fully agree that that also needs to be subject to empirical scrutiny. And we can learn a lot from our decades and decades of, of engagement in fragile and conflict-affected countries across uh, the world. So this has a lot of potential, and at CIPRI, we have been actually looking at all recipient countries for the past 30 years and investigated the relevance of the composition of aid in individual countries, um, bas basically breaking it down between humanitarian, more conventional development assistance, and peace-building assistance that looks precisely at inclusive participation, at strengthening core government functions, sort of nurturing that two-way two social contract. And we basically found that in post-conflict settings, when the share of this kind of peace-building uh, targeted support was more prominent, they were able to keep the peace, whereas other societies that received a lower share of this kind of assistance, unfortunately, relapsed um, into large-scale violence. Yeah, I think I will stop there and hand <laughs> over to my colleague. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I could agree more with the kind of uh, your words about the importance of, uh, of our Nordic peace research and, and kind of uh, its it history. The peace research has been as a part of a Nordic peace ecosystem for all, over half a decade or 60 years in Priya and, and 50 years of Atapri. Uh, 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 and I think that it have a many kind of important roles. It, it, it's, it's producing data based kind of uh, research, supporting perhaps a peace building, but it's also there to be a critical towards also towards a peacemaking, not only for the world around. And it should go beyond. It, it, it should give a vision. And I think this is a time where we should give, go beyond and, and give a lot of a vision of how world will look like and how we can address and inform because peace research is a research for the peace. It's not only about the research of the peace. And when I see the title Nordic Solidarity for Peace, I immediately quite a question that whose peace, how, uh, kind of what peace we are talking about and how we are kind of expressing this solidarity and, 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 and huge questions. And indeed, w w I think we are living in very turbulent e era that has been expressed many times already, already today. Uh, 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 but it seemingly that we cannot stop the change going on. The, the, the liberal order which we are living with the liberal multilateralism is seemingly kind of uh, changing. And in what direction we see that we have a return of an interstate war within Europe, but we have have already for many years strengthening authoritarian and illiberal contestation towards this order. Uh, and we have have a decolonial contest for, for a long time, which have to be taken seriously. Uh, and these two are combined in many places. And, and it, the result is that the kind of a peace building, peacemaking, it, its legitimacy is declining and leverage declining. Uh, uh, and, and we don't know in what direction what is going on. Maybe it's uh, going on in multi-order world. Maybe it's, it's something which Chinese are looking for, world of disorder. But the, we have to understand the changes and also to try to address that. Not only can depend what we have, it, but the world is changing. Uh, and I think that one of the key questions now is also is, is how the peacemaking, peace building, peace mediation look 
beyond this kind of a liberal universe, universalism, because we have to think about that, and, 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 and that we have the still peace kind of, a, kind of promotion for the peace, peace making in the future order, in, and, and they are not areas where the kind of peacemaking completely excluded. And I think here, the peace research is work, doing well in, in, in certain level. There are a lot of interesting theoretical kind of a discussion uh, introducing a new kind of ideas what peace is. Uh, uh, and also they, they are more and more interesting also kind of issue how the praxis of peace is, is, is looking on, on these kind of things. And I'm very much myself a kind of a, uh, uh, admired or, or idea of agonistic peace, but there are similar kind of things or, or called adaptive peace, uh, and, and, and they are offering an idea of a, could I say, con conflictual consensus where the, it, it's a possible to disagree without not the violence and, and, and how we, and I think that's we needed to be think about within the states uh, uh, and between the states, how we can create this kind of agonistic systems that, that we can mitigate it, a potential violence. It's also offering kind of idea that how peace systems could look like. That there are different kind of a peace systems and very locally, very broader, and it's good that we, we are kind of us researching them. Uh, then I have to be also critical to us a kind of a, a peace research and a Nordic peace research. I think that the, the Russian aggression towards Ukraine comes as a surprise for the, for, for the peace research in many ways. So that, and and, and uh, the kind of a, critical points here that the peace research has quite a lot of, have a focus on global south and then the all case studies of kind of focuses like in peacemaking, it's the Europe has been a bit of blind spot on here, especially the Eastern Europe and Russia, that's been not as much a kind of a, a kind of a studied. And, and, and it has been now time to kind of a turn our attention and our visionary thinking towards Europe and its future, and understanding in a broad perspective, not just the European Union, but the, including the whole Europe, and, 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 and think about how the world and Europe look like after, after the end, uh, uh, when the war comes to end in, 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 in Ukraine, how we build our kind of a new peace systems. And I think this has opened up a lot of a very concrete research question. I will end in here, and I'm very much working with this in, in myself, in Ferguson, it's, it's a question about Ukraine. You have to think about how you combine this kind of uh, uh, security guarantees, military issues, but also how to bring in, in the question that is the idea for the peace research, inclusivity of peace, a kind of democracy, and, and this is the kind of a difficult thinking. We, we, old kind of a way of thinking doesn't work there, but I, I, I'm kind of sure that there will come up a good ideas and I trust I've been engaged a lot with the Ukrainian colleagues and they are doing very good work on peace research on that and thinking how kind of a, how they put it, that you, you kind of how to win the war but not to lose the, the peace. That they, they have, you cannot have a militarized peace but you have an inclusive peace with the security guarantees. Another thing is, is, is as, as a kind of a coach is the OCCA, uh, the, the only kind of a European-wide security and peace organization which have in practice lost uh, its function, it's not anymore functioning. How we build a long perspective, a new peace system in a Europe that, we re that kind of a people again all around the Europe trust on peaceful future? Because I think here's the trust is this, which prevail in Europe. You trust that all conflicts are solved in peaceful manner and that we lost that with, with the kind of Russian aggression in, into Ukraine. How that be returned? I'll stop here and, and give it for you. <laughs> thank you, Marco. So nice to be here. Thank you so much for having us and thank you for organizing this really important discussion. I'm Anina Hegeman. I'm from the Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but I'm speaking today in a research capacity. Um, I want to take a step back and maybe as a peace researcher also give us an opportunity to take a broad view and say, what are really the sets of questions that we're grappling with today? I see sort of two sets of questions. I see some political questions about, is it in our foreign policy interest to invest more in peace building and peace research? And is there a Nordic special added value in this field? There are also some epistemological questions about what is the role of peace research? And what are examples of questions peace research can ask? Now to the first one, the one about 
the Nordic common foreign policy interest um, in peace research and peace building? I think we've had a lot of um, deliberations already answering that question. And it's quite clear um, that we have a joint interest in stronger multilateralism, in investing in prevention, in investing in peace building and peace research. I want to add, though, a point that I think is really important that, that no one has talked about today, um, which is we really need to improve communication of results and impact um, to convince our own taxpayers at home that we need a stronger engagement here. Because um, we're faced with realities of um, competing um, challenges and restricted budgets. So while these discussions are very important, um, we need more research, like the research that Yeni was just mentioning about the effects of peace building and the effects of peace research on how um, we can improve the world and why this is really in our core foreign policy interests. About um, the more epistemological questions about the role of peace, peace research and the examples of questions that we can ask, um, this may come as sort of, this may be um, self-implied, but I still want to raise the point that peace research asks a very fundamentally different question to a lot of other types of um, academic um, fields that engage with war and security. They ask, peace research asks the fundamental question of why war and how peace. It's basically about imagining so this is a very good opportunity um, to discuss the theme of the conference, right? Um, peace research, the foundations of peace research are about imagining different societies and different futures. And the approaches of peace research are all about inclusive dialogue, of listening, of understanding, and of critique. Um, so these questions, just as Marco said, we, we must not forget. Now, is there really a place for Nordic collaboration? We've touched a little bit on it, but we haven't actually gotten into the thick of it. Um, I wrote a, a report a few years ago um, with a colleague of mine, Isabel Bramson. It's called New Nordic Peace. Um, in that report, we talked to practitioners and researchers about um, Nordic collaboration on peace and conflict. Um, we found that Nordic cooperation in this field is often very organic. It comes informally. It comes naturally because we're very much alike. We have trust in each other, and we are often stronger together in the field. The primary challenge can sometimes be when we compete against each other and when we want to take credit, for example, for um, in, in peace diplomacy. And there, um, that's a challenge that we have to be aware of and also navigate. Um, in the key, some of the key areas where we can cooperate more are peace building, women, peace, and security. Um, but in our general, maybe the strongest one is the approaches to peace and the approaches to the way we engage in the world. Um, there are a number of recommendations in there. Um, a different thing, which I want to, my last point, which I want to come back to, is the whole added value of the Nordics. And I think um, there was a really important question raised um, by, by one of the young people about um, exporting colonial solutions. And um, I think as, as Nordics, we sometimes have tended to go out into the world with a discourse of exceptionalism. Um, and I think um, the time is probably up to come exporting solutions, but we don't, need to translate that into sort of um, picking ourselves completely apart. Because we do, in fact, have a very strong brand still. Um, we have a very strong legitimacy, a long track record to build on, especially in the way that we've done development and peace building. Not based in interests, but based in principles of human rights and development rights. We're small, so we've always had to listen to others. And we can be bridge builders. The fundamental role of peace research and peace building is that it trains our muscles in these areas. It trains our muscles of solidarity. It trains our muscles of imagining 
and it trains our mu muscles in terms of collaborating, of understanding others, understanding how they work and how we work with them to find solutions. And so I think we have a very credible um, way of engaging with the world and a very unique legitimacy as Nordics if we can embody that partnership approach um, and use peace research as a way to train that muscle. That is so excellently put. And I feel, of course, a little bit out of my league here, I must say, you know, with all my distinguished panelists here that come from a very rich tradition of peace research in the other Nordic countries. Uh, Have the Reykjavik Peace Center was only started a few years ago, so we feel that we are in our very early days and participating in something like this, putting this together and having all these uh, great colleagues from the Nordic countries here and all you participating as well is very much part of what it is that we want to do in fine-tuning where we want to go with Have the Reykjavik Peace Center in the next few years. Uh, the Nordic region is often described as off and for peace. A long-standing tradition of peace research is associated with the Nordic countries, as we have heard here today. So we are a bit of a late bloomer in this, and we're certainly looking forward to the next two days to be able to shape it even further. Uh, we have put a focus on non-conventional actors in our research and analysis on peace building from below, on acknowledging gender and other social groups, understanding the local in peace processes, and sub- and non-state actor roles as either spoilers or supporters of peace. You know, when the idea came about to partner up with the Icelandic presidency of the Nordic Council of Ministers this year, I must uh, let you in on a little bit of a secret. It was actually quite difficult to put the concept together. I mean, it often is. If you're trying to put together a concept note among academics, you know that it is a complex thing. But then when you actually add the policymakers into the mix, at times I felt a little bit, you know, yeah, I'll just admit it, a little bit fatigued. But we managed to pull it together. And then you could say that, of course, any kind of concept you make for something like this has to be wide reaching because we want the discussion to be on that level. So you have to kind of try to encompass everything. But I mean, when you look at the title, you could say Nordic Solidarity for Peace. Should it have a question mark? I mean, I don't want to be that pessimistic. So we're leaving out the question mark. But I nonetheless leave it up to you to discuss it further in the next two days, whether it should have had a question mark. Let's put it that way. But. Uh, Bringing together people from academia and policymakers, I believe, is one of the main roles that we want to be engaged in at Tavde Reykjavik Peace Center. So, and we're so very happy also about the Nordic collaboration that I feel that is really starting to bloom between us, the Nordic Peace Research Institute, that have been so instrumental in putting this together. So, yeah, I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. Uh Academics uh, usually stay in uh, ivory towers, and, and I think it's great, you know, just to be in the ivory tower, uh, ivory tower, not think about the world. Uh, I'm a historian, so I, I, I don't even need to think about the present. I can just think about the past. Uh, however, uh, we are discussing here how peace research, which is academically based, uh, how it can influence policymaking, and Pia came into it mentioned this, that uh, just organizing this, uh, uh, this conference was a little bit difficult because we speak a often a little bit different languages. Uh, and not we, but we and the policymakers. We uh, inhabit different worlds because our, our, uh, our politics, uh, academic politics, are very different from the real politics of the world. So I would like to ask you to, um, to uh, kind of uh, think about and, and, and and discuss uh, how the interplay between research and policy and decision making uh, may look like, uh, because we are, as you say, we mentioned the challenges we are facing today. Uh, Marco mentioned this kind of uh, refocusing on, on Europe, because suddenly that is clearly a, a policy area where peace research is important. And also, what are the modalities by which research uh, informs policy rather than staying on the shelf? How can we go out of the ivory towers and into the real world? 
So maybe I will go this way now. Yeah. Oh, I should start? <laughs> yep. That is excellent. <laughs> no, I think that the importance of, of uh, really involving uh, all sides is, is increasingly uh, an issue that we have to uh, discuss. We, we also, what you mentioned very much, many of you, is trust, of course. Um, I think that we as academics, as uh, universities, we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to engage in the dialogue that's going on. We have a responsibility to actually uh, bring about as much as we can facts into dialogues on whatever issues those are. So I think that is extremely important. We have to uh, face the fact that trust is eroding in academic findings. So this is a joint task for all of us to really focus on. But, but bringing uh, academics into the dialogue and, and facts on policy making is really it's extremely uh, important. It's a role we should take very seriously. Um, yeah, I think I'll just leave it at that and actually want to hear more from my wonderful colleagues here. Okay. Um, this is a really interesting question, the question of um, how we as researchers can, can contribute better to the policy dialogue and how can policy integrate our findings better. Um, I wrote a, a piece with a colleague, Isabel Bramson, on the relationship between um, researchers and practitioners in, in the field of Nordic peace research. And um, we identified a number of different modes of, of traveling. We use that term because in, a lot of the peace researchers use that term of traveling, both themselves traveling in and out of, of policy and having to translate between the different worlds, um, but also of concepts tra traveling, sometimes being misappropriated, but sometimes um, having great consequences for, for the policy world, but also of, of students traveling um, and the important role of, of education um, in terms of really um, building the foundations of um, critical mindsets, but also um, asking the right types of questions and having, bringing in the right forms of knowledge. Um, I think if we're to strengthen knowledge production in, in the peace research area, we need to look at some different areas. One is the, the ecosystems of knowledge production. So how do decision makers access knowledge? which forms of deliberation exist between policymakers and, and knowledge um, producers. Are researchers being brought in? Um, and are there um, systems that facilitate that? There are some interesting findings from Denmark um, from the COVID crisis where you had um, a, a very limited number of, of health experts being brought in um, with policymakers at the early stages. And there were a lot of mistakes made because the, the knowledge production base was quite narrow. Um, so it's very important that we have a diversification of knowledge brought in, especially in these times where the questions that we're answering are maybe about how do we best militarily engage in Ukraine? At the same time, we need to be asking all those more long-term questions and and questions that may seem counterintuitive, but which, for example, peace research has a tradition um, for asking. Um, in, in addition to ecosystems of knowledge production, we should also look at the processes of knowledge generation. Are policy makers asking the right kinds of questions at the right times? But also the forms of knowledge um, both in terms of asking the types of questions, but also in terms of, of um, packaging um, knowledge in the right ways. As, as Pia was mentioning, um, you know, the, 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 the status of knowledge has really been degraded, and, and you've, uh, others of you have mentioned this as well. So, so our, our very important um, credo as researchers to be better at um, communicating our results and the impact of, of our eff efforts in peace building. Um, that's something I started out by saying, but maybe I'll, I'll end there too, um, in that um, com 
communicating the impact clearly and having the dialogue at the right times with, with policymakers is really key. Yes, it's, it is interesting and, and really relevant question how we engaged with the other part of our peace ecosystems and our Nordic peace. I know these are nice words that we used here. So they're kind of a, it's expressing that in, in this field, they're kind of a, a feeling among the researchers, peace practitioners, policy makers, somehow to belong together in certain and broader way, which in my opinion, it's not as, as clear in many other spheres. I'm not knowing the other spheres so, of so, so how, how the kind of a social, kind of a uh, political scientists are, kind of, are, are engaging with uh, some policy makers or so. But I compare with a bit of the field which I know also is international relations studies, and, and, and here's a make a big difference between those who are in peace research and those who are studying more of political sciences, uh, uh, in, in also in the way they're putting the research question. It's easy to say so that the peace research is, is, is a research for the peace. It's more difficult to say what actually it means when you put the research question. It, it's not, uh, certainly not given easy answers. It's not given a kind of easily for policy relevant answers. It's not, not a kind of a, some kind of a ready-made kind of a guidelines for the practices how to do it, the better peacemaking or get a better kind of a results or, 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 or no, no, that, that it certainly is not. But its aim, its aim to make it a question that how also the change were taking place, how, how, and I, I think it's also kind of a responsibility and, 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 and a need to commit to the larger discussion for the peace and not staying there in Ivory Tower. And, and, and that's I'm probably meaning for the visionary thinking that somehow, uh, at least I feel that I, my responsibility is, is, is to kind of engage all the time in broader, broader discussion in my own capability on, on that. And, and, and that, that is really, really important part of uh, to be a peace researcher for me and personally. But also on the other hand, it has to be a kind of a knowledge that, that that's when you're talking with the practitioners and our researchers, we, we are producing our knowledge bit differently. We are maybe talking on the same issue, uh, almost with the same concept, but there are also differences. Uh, and, and it's really that, that how we're working, the others are kind of uh, thinking about how they created on, on, on some certain kind of uh, operations in the field and how they engage in the processes. We are sitting there in, in academic kind of uh, ivory tower uh, and, and critically looking at these. But what we need, and I think there are more and more perhaps coming on this, is the kind of engaging the practitioners and researchers in the dialogue. And in that way, creating on a kind of a, a new ideas, not perhaps a solution, but creating something, a beginning, some new way of thinking. And that's why we are doing that in, in Tampere in, 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 in the end of November, in first time we're organizing Tampere Peace Day there with the CMI. Uh, let's see how, how, how this works. Hopefully, it will be a great, great beginning of something which became perhaps a Nordic tradition. Uh, but more easily, kind of a more narrow way, perhaps, is also that at least those of us who have uh, uh, students, who have a kind of a degree programs, like we do have a master's program, International Master's Program, Peace, Mediation and Conflict Research, we are, I think many of those, our students, are finding the career in a broader peace kind of field. And, and, and I think that's the same way it's happening in many of other, I think about Uppsala, it's at least the same, same kind of career. We, we are teaching the future peacemakers, and they have a, this is also important in influence making, and, 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 and in that way. We, we have a mediation training, but then we are not training them as a mediator, we give them some early tools, for example, and a critical thinking, but also seeing that it's a kind of a great career, and, and, and need the courage to, to call on, on that field, a kind of a field. But I stopped. Stop there. So, yeah. Thanks a lot. Um, I think there are several challenges when it comes to the interplay between peace research and, and decision making. Uh, and the first one has been very well highlighted uh, in that sort of it takes two sides to tango. <laughs> so both researchers and policymakers they need to make uh, an effort. And um, I mean decision makers they are dealing with the reality as it is, uh, complex, uh, immediate and maybe too busy to reach out to scholars who may be unaware of the policy processes going on um, and the constraints that the decision makers are often facing 
and also differences in terminology, different formats for communicating uh, research and different spaces where we operate. I think the second challenge has to do with the distributed nature of peace promotion. And in that sense, I think it's very telling that we have uh, both a minister on development cooperation and a minister on you know, uh, labor affairs here, because unlike you know, warfare, where you, you have the Ministry of Defense, that's the single landing point in your institution, you know, peace promotion is distributed across all ministries and agencies and civil society and media. So um, um, you, have an, uh, you have an issue there. Then I also want to pick up on what Marco said about uh, sort of why have we been spending so much time focusing on conflicts in the global south? Because for the past like 30 years, that has been sort of where the conflicts, the manifest conflicts have been taking place. And if we would have been less biased to looking at ongoing large scale violence, but at sort of these varieties of peace or indicators of peace, we would have seen perhaps more clearly what was at stake in our own region. So, you know, there are peace indexes that have been flashing red for the past, uh, you know, period also when it comes to the state of peace in Western societies. So it's this constant bias towards the violence and the sort of um, um, insecurity that manifests and not on prevention or on trying to anticipate and, you know, uh, um, and that goes also for funding. It goes for the incentive structures when, when you actually publish. It's very interesting, my research publications on insecurity, violence, terrorism, you get a lot of sites, whereas the publications I do on peace, much less. So, uh, you know, it's revealing uh, something. So I think there are different ways forward. There are different suggestions that we could put on the table. One is to invest for the dialogue between researchers and policymakers in new spaces, modalities for exchange. Uh, and I think that some Nordic countries are very good at inviting researchers to the table and putting a contemporary policy problem there, asking for input rather than, you know, having to go through the research publications as, as such. Um, then I think there is also, you know, uh, a lot of opportunity to invest in peace research and uh, among the Nordic um, uh, uh, research institutes on the state of, of, of peace in the Nordic societies and outside, because I think we, we need to rethink and, you know, reflect on the current and, and, and past uh, uh, practices. But, but at the end of the day, um, peace is very precious. We need to strengthen and concentrate our intellectual focus uh, on it, along with the action, of course. Hmm. Thank you. And uh, yeah, that's a... Uh, I think it, it is a, a privilege, in a sense, to work in peace research. Because I mean, sort of, in, when I was a, a, a student, sort of growing up, in a sense, I had two supervisors. One were very rigorous in terms of methods, in terms of the data, in terms of uh, getting knowledge that didn't just respond to what I wanted to hear, but that that I could actually test my own assumptions. Uh, and the other was very, very focused on the fact that this knowledge is of critical importance for solving real problems, that there is a real world out there, that we shouldn't actually build up a, an ivory tower, we should actually realize that we are in, in this uh, global community. And I think as, as uh, students, you can really sort of going into this field, I think it's also good that you sort of understand and sort of formulate both of those profiles and, and make a, a decision, because there are also critical decisions in here in terms of as we have discussed here, what's the use of the knowledge and, 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 and what are the different roles uh, going into this? And I think I also feel very privileged. I am Swedish, but I, I work at, in a Nordic, uh, sort of a Norwegian uh, institute. And I think the, the Norwegian approach in terms of having a knowledge based foreign policy and inviting in researchers to, to have these dialogues is also an opportunity to actually then develop this further. And I think there are, two areas, and that's also why I started with sort of underlining that, that we have made this huge investment in, in data over the last 50 uh, so years. Uh, 
because I think what we're now approaching is a situation where there are many high quality data sets out there that allow almost for like big data analysis, which means that you can actually start to collect very sort of sound lessons learned, particularly in relation to, to development. Uh, and you can also make use of, so sort of we have sort of fine tune our research methods now that we can actually with much higher precision assess if development aid programs are actually reaching the targets, but also, for example, I mean, I live in Sweden, are the, are the uh, also a part of the time, are the efforts we are now putting into sort of creating sort of internal peace, are those actually working? Or is it so that we are, are formulating decisions based on assumptions rather than, than facts? So we, we could move in a sense towards both uh, assessing these policies more better, but also actually towards working actively with prevention of conflict and, and, and working with development. Uh, and I think in that it is also uh, just to, to tie in because I, I got very uh, encouraged with this discussion on, on sort of what kind of piece are we talking about that we are now, uh, again, I can feel at least that in the media and in the population, there is an increased interest again in, in discussing what is peace, what is security, what do we fill this with? It is the same kind of peace in North Korea as it is in Norway. I think most of us would probably say no. So what is then that kind of piece, the values we want to stand for? What, what should we sort of put into the peace concept and, and, and where do we go from here when we talk about Nordic peace? Uh, and in that, I'd just like to sort of underline, because uh, Janne and I were, were talking prior to this and I was also talking internally in, in PRIO with the people who have been part of building up peace research. Where, where, where could, could we in a sense go? Uh, and I think the, the first one, except for this uh, meeting in Reykjavik, which I, I think is a fantastic opportunity to have research and, and sort of decision makers be part of the same debate, because there are too few of these sort of public forums that, uh, where we can actually meet uh, as sort of between the Nordic uh, countries. So I think that is a, a wonderful initiative. So how can we sort of build on, on creating those kinds of forums? The second one is uh, that there is actually no really like dedicated funding for peace research in a Nordic context that has criteria for Nordic researchers working together. Mm -hmm. so, so like we have Nordforsk for example, but they don't have any programs on, on peace research. So is, is there platforms that we already have that we could make use of even more targetly in order to actually get a research project that, that cuts across? And that could ask questions about the Nordic peace, but also about how we move forward on peace. Because I think uh, one of the most serious sort of uh, discussions we enter into is that now become, we become very much focused on our own security and, and that I think we should, that is a fair thing, we need to do that. But we're also part of this global cooperation, we have a long history of development support and many of the conflicts still take place in the global south. And we have to come, be able to be actors both in the global south and, and in our own region. So how, how do we do that? Uh, and finally, I think, which I think this panel is also a really good example of in the sense that uh, we need to create these, like Jani said, forums for also in, in our national context for continuous, more long-term exchanges. And we had, uh, uh, when Norway was in the Security Council, pre Nupi and the MFA, we organized these meetings that we brought together researchers to the MFA uh, to have these critical and frank discussions. And I think that was really appreciated from researchers who got a better understanding of what do you actually face when you're in the Security Council, because that's not something you can as a researcher just imagine. You have to have a dialogue in order to understand that. Uh, and, and if you understand that, you're also much better at giving advice. Uh, but it was also appreciated by the researcher by the fact that there was no, you didn't have to have a, a, a specific uh, you didn't have to agree. It was perfectly fine to disagree and just have this open critical discussion. And I think that is a trademark of the Nordic countries where we can also sort of, because we come into this with different roles, but we can have this kind of respect. Uh, and I think that, uh, and building on what Anin said in terms of that also in a sense require us to perhaps think even more strategically about researchers who are good at impact work. That we actually think about that as a competence 
uh, and recognize what that means. I worked 10 years in the, in the Swedish government agency and now I'm back in research. In a sense, I have two really good CVs, but you can't pile them on top of each other. You can actually just get to a certain point. So how do we, in a sense, see and, and recognize this third assignment that actually gets us out of the, of the ivory tower? Because there are both expectations, but also recognized competence built into this. Because then I think we can be even sharper tools to, to help uh, with the engagement that we, we are already sort of part of as peace researchers. This is highly inspiring. I'm actually going to just grab the word, if I can, for just one minute to kind of uh, thank you for these comments. Because, of course, this is very much what we were thinking and wanting to do with the Imagine Forum and are hoping that we can lead that forward into further collaboration between the Nordic Peace Research Institutes. I think it's very important. But then also tying it, of course, to the decision makers of the Nordic countries. There have been some uh, um, areas that this has been done. You know, when there are ministerial meetings, there is like a latch on, uh, uh, perhaps a joint lunch or something where you bring together researchers and decision makers. I think that's very important to try to foster that because the times that we are now facing are very challenging. And uh, like you have all mentioned as well, uh, of course, the countries are thinking about their security now, but we have to think about the peace. I mean, this is really what we have to be focused on in the long run. So uh, for us all to kind of join up, I think is extremely important. Just wanted to mention that. Good. Uh, this is supposed to be a dialogue between uh, the policymakers and the researchers, so I would like to invite the two ministers here in uh, the audience, uh, Anne-Beat uh, Tinnerheim and uh, Guðmund Ringi Guðbrandsson, to come up here. And to <laughs> ministers are always busy, so uh, we know that. But we are very glad to uh, have two ministers here, and, and we will definitely want them to, uh, to come here and respond to the questions that we have been discussing, <laughs> and kind of tie these things together, uh, the two sides of the story here, the policymakers and, and the researchers. So, Anne what what is your reaction to what you have heard so far? Uh, how do you see this kind of, uh, in practice, uh, mm. this uh, cooperation and dialogue between research and policymaking? How do you drag us out of the ivory towers <laughs> into the Thank real you. world? Thank you. Thank you. I've, I've really enjoyed this conversation. Extremely useful and food for thought. And we were just discussing mm -hmm. the table or you know, whispering to each other that this is, um, you know, this is, this is something that we could really grab as Minister of Nordic Cooperation and develop. Uh, so very inspirational. Uh, I'd like to make a few comments, if I may. Uh, first of all, I don't, I, uh, my impression is definitely not that uh, researchers are up in their, are hiding in their ivory towers. At least my experience from Norway is that you are extremely uh, engaged in, uh, uh, in society, in actual debates, uh, uh, giving us advice, but also, um, uh, uh, what, what's the right word, being our watchdog. <laughs> um, and uh, you mentioned an example that I actually had put on my list as well, how we were able to interact when, not only well, Norway, but before that Sweden um, held a position in the Security Council, I felt that that dialogue with research, uh, re researchers was very, very useful for both parties and, and really something to, to copy uh, on, on uh, other relevant agendas. Um, and uh, also, one thing that we haven't, that you haven't discussed that much is, the, but I would like to commend you on, is uh, research on normative agendas, where I really feel that the, the Nordic, pers the Nordics really have played, have made a difference. Um, for example, in terms of the agendas of um, women, peace and security, uh, sexual or conflict related sexual violence and gender, where we see the big pushback internationally right now, but to have researchers that are able to, to, to uh, to lift the normative agendas and giving us policy advice on how to, to, to counter that pushback is extremely valuable. Um, and um, another, uh, so two more points. One, we were talking about trust. 
and the importance of having statistics and research to counter false narratives and hybrid attacks. And, you know, one ask from policy makers is, you know, we, we need help. The polarization also within our own society is increasing. We don't really, you know, we are, we are looking for answers. This is something new for us as governments as well, to confront that extreme threat to the peace of our societies. And, um, um, you know, I, I mentioned in my introduction uh, the case of immigration, but also uh, climate initiatives in terms of securing a just transition on climate action to avoid polarization on the climate, the, 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 the national climate uh, agenda as well. Uh, we, 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 we really need your help to counter those, uh, that development. Um, one last um, thought. When I was briefed before this conference, I was told, and you might disagree, but I was told that when, uh, when you know, the, the, the research institutions uh, popped up in, in the 50s and 60s, you know, with Prio and Copri and Cipri and Tapri, um, there was a very strong Nordic network in regular Nordic levels. While today, at least this is what I've been told, the cooperation is more based on projects and sort of maybe one or two researchers from each country. So just food for thought, um, you know, is there uh, room for more strategic and uh, systematic cooperation across the Nordics to sort of Take it, take it one le level up and think more strategic in terms of how we, how we work together. That would be interesting and uh, definitely something that we would like to discuss in the mm -hmm. um, Nordic Cooperation Ministerial Council as well. Thank you. Yeah, I think I'll just um, make a short comment on the last point that Anna Beate mentioned because, uh, I mean, we all go into politics to try to influence society, right? And I'm not saying that I went into politics to lift up the research of your institutes, but I am definitely <laughs> willing to try my best to do so. And I think because we have this um, emphasis in the Icelandic chairmanship this year, it would be a wonderful outcome of all this initiative that we are having here, I mean, today and tomorrow, but also during our chairmanship, that we could somehow lift this up. And we are constantly being reminded recently that there is much need for it. Mm. And what Anna Beate said about systematically trying to make the cooperation uh, or make the cooperation more, more, more systematic is, is, is a good idea, I think. So let's see if we can move this forward um, uh, later. Um, what I wanted to uh, comment on, I mean, Anna Beate went through climate change, she mentioned immigrants, women's rights. Uh, I absolutely agree with, with all of these. I wanted to take the, um, the issue of, of the, 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 the increased number of immigrants in our own societies and the in many ways, um, at least that's, that's what we see here in Iceland, that, the, that, that immigrants overall have lesser opportunities in our societies. They are more likely to uh, bail out of school. They are more likely to be um, in jobs that pay less. Um, and we are increasingly, at least in, in our society, seeing hate speech being directed towards these groups. And I think this is something that we internally, and I don't think Iceland is um, a special case in this. It is, is what is happening all, all in all of the Nordic countries. So if I take this first, like internally, what can we do and how can research help us to deal with these issues? Because we, as policymakers, um, we, we need that help. 
we need better understanding of why do these conflicts arise? Why, why is there um, a difference in, um, or, or in the social status of people, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? What are the root causes? How can we, how can we try to, to fix those? And I think this is important for basically our internal piece mm -hmm. uh, here. Um, and then I absolutely agree on, on the climate change and, and women, like, like Anna Beate said. One more thing I wanted to mention, um, and that, that, that has to do with bridging the, the gap between academia and policymakers. And I, <laughs> I think that my question was actually, how do you get to that ivory tower? I'm, I'm quite <laughs> interested in that. I, I always wanted to be a, a researcher, and you know, that was supposed to be my career. And I remember, I remember, uh, so I'm a biologist, I remember uh, professors at the University of Iceland talking about nature conservation on the media. That was not very, very well uh, as, uh, sort of accepted by uh, politicians at that time, this is 20 years ago, and I remember, am I really going to do this, <laughs> you know, to make a career where I, I feel maybe a little bit that it's difficult to express my uh, opinion, so then I went into politics. Um, but what I, what I think is that I think politicians, they look at ac academics a little bit too much as, oh, they are up there, they don't really understand real-world problems. And academics, they, they look at politicians like, yeah, they don't really understand this. And I mean, guys, this is, isn't helpful, is it? We have to be able to um, trust, have more trust in, in one another and, and create a dialogue. So I think that is something we can also take out of this because we can do much better here. We need to bridge this gap better. And we always talk about it <laughs> a lot. But okay. Anna Beate and I, we are going to fix this problem, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Time is flying. Uh, I do not want to uh, take lunch away from people here. Uh, we have been discussing uh, so far uh, hope. Uh, and I think the Nordic countries can present some hope to the world on how we can cooperate together peacefully. Uh, the Nordics are not genetically uh, peaceful. Nordic, uh, the Nordic countries were not peaceful in the past. There was a huge war between the different Nordic countries in the past. So this is not something that is, uh, is kind of genetically um, ingrained in us. This is something that we have worked at uh, this is something that we have, we need constantly to work at. So we can provide, hopefully, some hope for things that things can be better. And this is very much based on trust. And I, think, I think that is, uh, that is the kind of fundamental uh, um, value of Nordic cooperation is, is trust in each other. So I, I think, basically, uh, this is something that we can offer to the world. I also... Uh, feel that uh, there is this kind of, uh, there is not as much distance between politicians and academics as there are in many other countries. Mm -hmm. So I think that is also something that we could build on. Mm -hmm. And one of the messages that I would like to bring out of this, this session is that we need more, I mean, we need robust dialogue between politicians and, and academics, but you also need strong dialogue between the Nordic countries. And, and I think that is something that we might try to promote uh, from this dialogue here. How can the Nordic Peace Institutes and re researchers cooperate better uh, in their common interest in, in, uh, in promoting peace research, research and looking for kind of practical solutions to, uh, to the problems we are facing and challenges we are facing. Uh, in the two days world. So, thank you very much. Uh, this has been a very interesting and, and thoughtful uh, discussion, and I think now we go to lunch. <laughs> <laughs>